In this video we'll be going through the 2020 Waves exam. Question 1. Mia and Arya are at the swimming pool. They notice the lifeguards are using a convex mirror on the wall to help them see the swimmers in the pool. Complete the ray diagram below to show the formation of the image. So for this I'm going to draw three rays. We only really need two to find an intersection, but three rays is thorough. And is a good double check in case we do one of the rays wrong. I'm going to start by drawing the ray that reflects symmetrically about the middle. Which I'll then backtrace. Since our rays are going to be diverging, we are going to end up with a virtual image. Next I'm going to draw a ray parallel to the principal axis and then reflecting away from the focal point, which we will once again backtrace. Now lastly I'm going to draw a ray that goes towards the focal point and then when it hits the mirror it is going to reflect parallel to the principal axis. And I'll backtrace this one as well. And now as we can see we have our image right here. Question B. Describe the nature, size and orientation of the images of the swimmers formed by the mirror. Assume the mirror is far away from the swimmers. And as we can see our image is upright. We can see that it is smaller so it's diminished. And because we had to backtrace our rays, um, the rays are diverging in real space, we need to imagine that they converge. We have a virtual image. Question C. The lifeguards could have used a plane or concave mirror. By describing the possible images from each mirror, explain whether either mirror is suitable for the lifeguards to see the whole of the pool. So the main advantage of the convex mirror is that we're going to get an increased field of view. Because of how the mirror is shaped, we're going to get a greater than 180 degree wraparound view. So the main point is the field of view. But also with the convex mirror, we get an upright image, which is handy, which we wouldn't get with the concave mirror. The image from the concave mirror is also going to be real, which means we'd need a screen to project it on, so we wouldn't be able to see it in the mirror. So let me put that down into words. The plane mirror would produce an upright virtual same size image, the concave mirror would produce a real inverted image. Both would have less field of view than the convex mirror, so would not display as much of the pool. The children's play pool has a small partition with a large convex lens built into it to create patterns in the water. Mia is 1.7 meters tall and stands 2 meters away from the lens, which has a focal length of 0.5 meters. Calculate the distance of her image from the lens. So firstly, let's establish what we have. We have the focal length, we have the distance of our object, which is Mia, and we also have the height of Mia. Now the equation that's going to be most useful here is Descartes, which you'll find on your formula sheet. And given that we know the focal length and the distance of the object, we just need to solve this for di, the distance of the image from our lens. I'm first going to do that by subtracting 1 over do from both sides. And I'm going to flip the sides around as well. And now I'm going to flip both sides. I'm going to take the inverse of both sides. Putting our numbers in. Which gives me 0 0.67 to two significant figures since that's the lowest amount we're given in the question here. Next question. Calculate the height of her image. Now for this we can use the equation on your formula sheet. That is that di over do is equal to hi over ho. We just found out di, we're given do. We know ho, 1.7 up here. So we just need to solve this for hi. We can do so by multiplying both sides by ho. 
and I'm also going to swap the sides around. Putting our numbers in, which gives me 0 0.5695, rounding that to two significant figures, gives me 0 0.57 meters. The next question asks us to describe the nature, size, and orientation of her image. So one way to go about these types of questions is to just remember what the lenses do at certain points. There's really not too much to remember, but if you're at a blank in an exam, you should get into the practice of doing quick ray diagrams. So let's try to do one now. Now if our focal length is 0 0.5 meters, she's standing 2 meters away, so she's standing 4 times that distance. So I'm going to put my focal length here, and let's say that Mia is roughly here. Doing our first ray through the middle, our second ray parallel to the axis, and then through the focal point, or near to it. We see that our image is going to be diminished, which reflects what we found here. We found that the height of the image is 0 0.57 compared with the object, which is 1.7. We see that it's inverted and we also see that it's real. So doing a quick ray diagram can be a super efficient way of answering these questions if you're unable to remember the exact properties of how each lens works. Question 2. Arya sees an object on the bottom of the pool at the shallow end and reaches down to grab it. She finds that the object is actually deeper than it looked to be. Name the phenomenon that causes the object to appear at a different depth. The phenomenon is of course refraction. Going into the exam, this is a situation you should be already familiar with. If you're not, then what you need to look up is a concept called apparent depth. The formation of the image can be represented using a ray diagram. Complete the diagram above to locate the image of the object. So doing these particular kinds of ray diagrams is more arbitrary than we're used to doing in physics. Basically the idea is that we're going to have two rays coming off the object, striking the boundary. As they reach this interface, they are going to refract into the eye. We know that they're going to bend in this particular way because when we're going from a slow material to a quick material, the rays are going to bend away from the normal. Now to find the location of the image, we need to backtrace these rays. And so there's our image. Now, just a, a side note, I'm very much not a fan of these types of diagrams because they make it seem like depth perception is handled just by a single eye and that we're able to tell depth perception based on a ray hitting the top of the pupil versus the bottom of the pupil. In reality, you need two eyes. What these rays are meant to represent is a ray going to each individual eye. So this is, say, your left eye, this is the one going to your right eye. The diagram does a terrible job of representing this. In fact, I'd go as far to say that it's destructively misleading. Moving on. Use physics principles to give a full explanation of how the process in part B causes the observer to see the image at the position located by your diagram. And so there are a couple of key ideas here. The first is that we have refraction, that we have the rays bending away from the normal as they go from the water to the air. And the second is that our eyes backtrace the rays as if they carry on straight. Our eyes are not aware that any bending has occurred, so they assume that the direction that the rays are going is the exact direction in which they came from. So let's put that down into words. As the rays exit the water, they are refracted away from normal. Although the rays have been bent, the eye assumes they travel in a straight path from their origin. This causes the image to be perceived in a different location to the object. 
Mia jumps into the deep end and looks up and sees the bottom of the pool reflected above her, as shown below, or as would be shown below. With the power of post-editing magic, abracadabra. We're given the refractive index of air, and also the refractive index of the water. Identify the phenomenon that is taking place in the photo. Well, although I can't currently see what the image is, though you can. The fact that we're seeing a reflection of the bottom of the pool, although we're looking up, means that we're talking about total internal reflection. Write a comprehensive explanation of how this phenomenon occurs. Include the conditions required and a calculation of the critical angle. And so if we have a ray coming in on a particular angle, we're going to see it refract away from the normal. Because it's going from a slow medium to a fast medium. At a particular incident angle, however, that we call the critical angle, the ray is in fact going to bend so far from the normal line that it will in fact go along the boundary of the materials. If you were to further increase the angle of incidence, then our refracted ray would disappear entirely and you would be left with just a reflection. That is the simplified picture that we give to Year 12 students. So let me try put that into words. As the rays exit the water, they bend away from the normal. If the angle of incidence is equal to the critical angle, the ray will bend 90 degrees and travel along the boundary. Increasing the angle further will cause the refracted ray to disappear and the ray will be totally reflected. So let's now find our critical angle. So for that we're going to use Snell's law, where our first angle is our critical angle. And our second angle is going to be 90 degrees. Now since sine of 90 is 1, that just becomes N2. Dividing both sides by N1. And now taking the inverse sine of both sides. Putting our numbers in. Which gives me 48.75. Rounding that to three significant figures, because that's what we're given in the question, gives me 48.8. Now, just as a note, if you're tearing your hair out because you can't figure out why you're not getting that answer, though you're typing exactly this into your calculator, double check that your calculator is indeed in degrees, not radians. Question three. There is a third pool with a wave machine. The pool has a deep and a shallow end. The wave machine generates waves with a period of 2.3 seconds. The speed of the waves in the deep end is 2.75 meters per second, which I'm just going to call V subscript D. Calculate the wavelength of the waves in the deep end. So to do this, we can use the equation that the velocity is equal to the frequency times the wavelength. We can solve this for wavelength by dividing both sides by frequency, and I'm also going to put wavelength on the left hand side. And you might note that we don't have the frequency, but we do have the period. And we know that the frequency is equal to 1 over our period. So we can just make that substitution. Now, if you have 1 over something in a denominator, that actually just brings that something up to the numerator. So we can write it like this. Much simpler. Putting our numbers in gives me 6.3 meters to two significant figures. Two significant figures because that's the least that we're given here. The waves move from the deep end to the shallow end of the pool. Complete the figure below to show the effect of change on depth on the appearance of the wave fronts. So let's think about what happens when our waves move from the deep to the shallow end. Well, throughout the refraction process, which this is, this is still refraction, our frequency stays the same. Now, as we move to the deep end to the shallow end, our velocity is going to decrease. Now, given that we know that velocity is equal to frequency times wavelength, we just use that relationship above. If our frequency stays the same, 
and our velocity goes down, then our wavelength must also go down. That means that in the shallow end, our waves are going to be closer together. Use your diagram to describe and explain how the wavelength, amplitude and frequency of the waves would be affected as they move from the deep to the shallow water. Which is for the most part what I was just explaining. We know that the frequency of the waves does not change because it just never does when we have refraction. However, because we have reduction in speed, we therefore have a reduction in wavelength. Now furthermore, because our waves are more bunched up, that is going to mean they're going to be taller, that the amplitude is going to increase. So let's write those three comments. The frequency will not change. As the velocity decreases and v equals f lambda, the wavelength must also decrease. As the wavelength is less, the energy of the wave is more concentrated, thus the amplitude will increase. On one side of the pool there are two lights, and on the other side of the pool there are two speakers. Describe and explain the difference between the waves emitted by the lights and the sound waves emitted by the speakers. Your answer should include comparison of the wave type, the need for a medium, and the speed of the waves. And so how this is phrased here, we're really just asked not to talk specifically in regards to this situation, but just to explain the differences between light and sound waves. So when we talk about wave type, well, light is a transverse wave, whereas sound is a longitudinal wave. This should be something you're already familiar with. Light does not require a medium, whereas sound requires a medium to compress. And as for the speed of the waves, light goes very quickly at 300 million meters per second, whereas sound is more in the realm of 300. So let's write that down. Light is a transverse wave and does not require a medium. It travels very fast at roughly 300 million meters per second. Sound is a longitudinal wave and does require a medium. It travels much slower at roughly 340 meters per second in air. During a test of the evacuation siren, a sound of a constant frequency is emitted continuously from both speakers. A lifeguard walks along the pool on the opposite side from the speakers. Use physics principles to explain and justify what the lifeguard would hear. You may use a diagram to illustrate your explanation. So this question here is your chance to flex your knowledge of two-point interference. So let's do our diagram first. We have our two speakers here, and I'm going to do this the best I can. And so our key idea here is that we're going to have lines of constructive interference and lines of destructive interference. So the points we want to make is that there's going to be an interference pattern, there are going to be antinodal lines that the lifeguard will cross, in which there'll be constructive interference where peaks are meeting peaks, troughs are meeting troughs, and they'll get a loud amplitude as a result. And then there'll be nodal lines that the lifeguard will cross, where there'll be peaks meeting troughs, creating destructive interference, and there won't be any amplitude, neglecting any reflections, of course. So let's put that into words. The speakers will create an interference pattern of nodal and antinodal lines. Nodal lines are lines of destructive interference where little or no sound is heard. Here waves meet 180 degrees out of phase. Antinodal lines are lines of constructive interference where a doubling of amplitude is heard. Here waves meet in phase. As a result, the lifeguard will hear alternating quiet and loud areas. And that's it.